And a very good evening, everybody. This is Live Irish Myths. My name is Anthony Murphy. This is Mythical Ireland. You're all very welcome along. This is episode 11 uh, of the daily webcast slash podcast slash live broadcast, whatever you want to call it. But uh, for the first couple of minutes, if you hear any yelping in the background, that's because it's feeding time here for the dogs and the two of them get rather excited when the food is being prepared. And in that regard, I should probably say, uh, uh, extend a special thanks to my family who, uh, when the broadcast is on, uh, are, are, are very cooperative in trying to keep the noise down. Um, and also to say to my wife, Anne, and to my mother, Ethna, uh, a very happy Mother's Day. Um, and to all the mothers, indeed, not just the ones who will be watching this evening, but all the mothers in Ireland and around the world uh, who have uh, one heck of a job uh, to do. And hats off uh, in great admiration of all of you. And thanks for what you do. T this evening, we are going to be talking about Oisin in the land of Tirnanog. But before I get to that, just the usual housekeeping. Uh, just to remind you that if you are coming to this series for the first time, uh, that uh, if you want to see all of the previous episodes, they are available all together in one place on the Mythical Ireland blog. Uh, the short link to that I'm going to paste in as a comment immediately below the video. Don't forget to say hello and tell us where you are. And if you have comments or questions, we'll take those. So that's a short link. It's a bit.ly link, a bit.ly link. And that takes you to the blog where you can see all previous 10 episodes. And I will, of course, upload this episode as a video to YouTube later. Uh, and so you can watch them all. Jacqueline Kennedy is in uh, watching. Hello, Jacqueline. You're very welcome. Alberto Tracali is saying good evening. And I think Alberto is in Italy. Uh, all our best wishes to you and your fellow country people in the battle against COVID-19. Um, and we hope and pray for a, a fast turnaround to that situation and a huge improvement. Um, Cindy Daniels Graven is watching. Hello, Cindy. <laughs> Thanks for keeping us entertained with your music. Erin Durrett is uh, in from Vashon Island. Again, Jules Cousins. Hello, Jules. Vicky Wallace is in from Oregon. Dana Hicks from San Diego. Lorraine O'Dwyer in Wexford. Looking forward to tonight's episode. Cindy is in Missouri. Thanks, Cindy, for reminding us where you are. Carolyn Logan is in Florida. Brendan Kinch is in Cartagena in Spain. Hello again, Brendan. Freya is uh, saying hello again. Um, Freya, you'll have to forgive me. I think you said you're in Finland, but if you're not, please correct me. Kira McHugh is watching from Armagh. Vicky, of course, is in Oregon. Maggie Pratt is in Maryland in the mountains. Well, do you know what? Probably a good place to be at the moment. Stay away from civilization as much as possible. Shannon Stater Tina is in California. Wow. Um, well, thank you all for saying hello. And if there are more mentions, we'll get to mention you as the time goes on. So we'll just get a little bit of an introduction to Oisin from Dara Smith's Guide to Irish Mythology. Oisin was the great poet of the Fenian cycle of Irish tales, son of Finn McCool or Fionn McCool. His mother, Blaye, B-L-A-I father, is said to have borne him while she was in the shape of a doe. Ah, uh, Freya is in Sweden, not in Finland. I do apologise, Freya. Sarah Davis is watching from Illinois. Hello, Sarah. Anita is in Austria. Very good evening to you, Anita. I hope you're keeping well. His mother is said to have returned to the she of Bly. Sorry, he is said to have returned to the she of Bly when he died. His name is said to mean little deer or little seal. Oshin Macfion Far Gugnol Rogyanur A Gluon Yachter Ingen Gerig A Waharwa Thorhak Mi Mish On Moor Fla. Oshin, son of Fionn, a man of prowess, 
was born at Clun Yochter. The daughter of Jarug was his worthy mother. She bore him nine times in her womb. It was the function of the filly or poet to record pagan or pre-Christian Ireland. Oshin is our perennial laureate and indeed the Fenian cycle is sometimes referred to as the Oceanic cycle and vice versa. However, the Fenian cycle begins with the Battle of Knucha or Castle Knock in AD 174 and ends with the Battle of Gaura or Garristown in AD 283, whilst the Oceanic cycle goes beyond this historical period, firstly because Oshin survives the Battle of Gaura, and secondly as he enters the other world, returning to Ireland after 300 years. And there are further uh, comments. Catherine Wall McManus is saying hello, hello, Catherine. Uh, Sheila Murphy Weekly is in watching from West Virginia, USA. Good evening to you, Sheila. Good afternoon. Uh, Lee Trabal is in Pennsylvania. Hello, Lee. You're very, very welcome. Thank you for dropping in on tonight's live webcast. Oshin takes part in many of the Fenian tales. Together with Finn, Coilche, Insna, Oscar and Conan Moyle, Oshin constitutes the Fian, the body of six warriors whose many adventures are reco recorded widely, notably in the works of Owen McNeil and P.W. Joyce. And it is P.W. Joyce I will be reading from tonight in the story of Oshin in Tirnanog. The pursuit of Jirmad and Gráinne, Thorigacht Jirma Agus Gráinne, is perhaps the greatest saga from the Fenian cycle and one for another episode. At the beginning of this story, Gráinne is equal in her desire for both Oshin and Jirmud, but as she is to be wedded to Finn, Oshin's father, she decides to elope with Jirmud. And I don't think we'll go too much into that uh, because we can... This is a summary of both that and the uh, the story that I'm about to read. Uh, Frank Murphy is watching. Hello, Frank. Sheila is calling in some of our friends. Great stuff. Oshin Clark says, woo. <laughs> Oshin, that's a great name you have there. Fabulous Irish name straight out of mythology, huh? I'm just sucking on a mint. I'm just going to be finished that shortly. I should have done. I should have finished that before I started, but I do apologize. Oshin in Tirnanog, or the last of the Fianna. And Tirnanog is the land of youth. Cheer being land or country, and I shouldn't be touching my face, and I'm, I have to try and stop doing that. And Og meaning young or youth. Tirnanog, the land of youth. According to an ancient legend. Finn's son, Oshin, the hero poet, survived at the time of St. Patrick, 200 years, the legend makes it 300, after the other Fina. On a certain occasion, when the saint asked him how he had lived to such a great age, the old hero related the following story. And Liam McLaughlin is saying hello from Mullingar. Hello, Liam, and I hope you're keeping well. The, uh, the homeland of Ishnach, the centre of Ireland. A short time after the fatal Battle of Gavra, that's how it's uh, anglicised here, Gavra or Gaura, where so many of our heroes fell, we were hunting on a dewy morning near the brink of Loch Lane, and Loch Lane is uh, in the lakes of Killarney in County Kerry, where the trees and hedges around us were all fragrant with, fragrant with blossoms and the little birds sang melodious music on the branches. We soon roused the deer from the thickets, and as they bounded over the plain, our hounds followed them, followed after them in full cry. We were not long so engaged when we saw a rider coming swiftly towards us from the west, and we soon perceived that it was a maiden on a white steed. We all ceased from the chase on seeing the lady who reined in as she approached. And Finn and the Fianna were greatly surprised, for they had never before seen so lovely a maiden. A slender golden diadem encircled her head, and she wore a brown robe of silk, spangled with stars of red gold, which was fastened in front by a golden brooch, and fell from her shoulders till it swept the ground. Her yellow hair flowed far down over her robe in bright golden ringlets, her blue eyes were as clear as the drops of dew on the grass, 
and while her small white hand held the bridle and curbed her steed with a golden bit, she sat more gracefully than the swan on Loch Lane. The white steed was covered with a smooth flowing mantle. He was shod with four shoes of pure yellow gold, and in all Erin a better or more beautiful steed could not be found. And I'm saying hello to David Gilroy, who's watching. Hello, David. You're very welcome along again. Rebecca Byrne is watching. Hi, Rebecca. How are you? Uh, Irene Sherry is saying hello from Galway. You're very welcome from Conde na Goliath. As she came slowly to the presence of Finn, he addressed her courteously with these words. Who art thou? Of course, remember that this is a, a, a very English translation. It's who art thou? It sounds almost... Um, Shakespearean, O oh, lovely youthful princess, tell us thy name and the name of thy country, and relate to us the cause of your coming. She answered in a sweet and gentle voice, Noble king of the Fina, I have had a long journey this day, from, for my country lies far off in the western sea. I am the daughter of the king of Tirnanog, and my name is Neave of the Golden Hair. And what is it that has caused thee to come far across the sea? Has your husband forsaken you? Or what other evil has befallen you? I'm going to, I'm going to change the thys and the these to you and all that. My husband has not forsaken me, for I have never been married or betrothed to any man. But I love thy noble son, Oshim, and this is what has brought me to Aaron. It is not without reason that I have given him my love, and that I have undertaken this long journey. For I have often heard of his bravery and gentleness and the nobleness of his person. Many princes and high chiefs have sought me in marriage, but I was quite indifferent to all men and never consented to wed till my heart was moved with love for the gentle son Oshim. And Federica is saying hello from Torino in northern Italy and all our best wishes to you, uh, Federica. Very good evening. When I heard these words and when I looked on the lovely maiden with her glossy golden hair, I was all over in love with her. I came near and, taking her small hand in mine, I told her she was a mild star of brightness and beauty and that I preferred her to all the princesses in the world for my wife. Then, said she, I place you under Gessa, which true heroes never break through, to come with me on my white steed to Tirnanog, the land of never-ending youth. It is the most delightful and the most renowned country under the sun. There is abundance of gold and silver and jewels, of honey and wine, and the trees bear fruit and blossoms and green leaves together all the year round. You will get a hundred swords and a hundred robes of silk and satin and a hundred swift steeds and a hundred slender, keen-scenting hounds. You will get herds of cows without number, and flocks of sheep with fleeces of gold, a coat of mail that cannot be pierced, and a sword that never missed a stroke, and from which no one ever escaped alive. There are feasting and harmless pastimes each day. A hundred warriors fully armed shall always await you at call, and harpers shall delight you with their sweet music. You will wear the diadem of the king of Tirnanog, which he never yet gave to any one under the sun, and which will guard you day and night, in tumult and battle and danger of every kind. Lapse of time shall bring neither decay nor death, and you shall be for ever young and gifted with unfading beauty and strength. All these delights you shall enjoy, and many others that I do not mention, and I myself will be your wife if you come with me to Tirnanog. Margaret Ring says, Evening, a beautiful spring day for Mother's Day. And wasn't it a fabulous day today? And happy Mother's Day to you, Margaret. And indeed, as I said at the outset, to all the mothers who are watching and, and even those who aren't watching far and wide. I replied that she was my choice above all the maidens in the world and that I would willingly go with her to the land of youth. When my father, Finn and the Fianna, heard me say this and knew that I was going from them, they raised three shouts of grief and lamentation. And Finn came up to me and took my hand in his, saying sadly, Woe is me, my son, that you are going away from me, for I do not expect that you will ever return to me. The manly beauty of his countenance became quite dimmed with sorrow, and though I promised to return after a little time, and fully believed that I should see him again, I could not check my tears as I gently kissed my father's cheek. 
Isn't that very sad? I then bade farewell to my dear companions and mounted the white steed while the lady kept her seat before me. She gave the signal and the steed galloped swiftly and smoothly towards the west till he reached the strand and when his gold shod hoofs touched the waves he shook himself and neighed three, th three times. He made no delay but plunged forward at once moving over the face of the sea with the speed of a cloud shadow on a March day. What do you know? The wind overtook the waves and we overtook the wind so that we straightway lost sight of land. And we saw nothing but billows tumbling before us and billows tumbling behind us. Other shores came into view and we saw many wonderful things on our journeys. Islands and cities, lime white mansions, bright green ons, a summer house and lofty palaces. A hornless fawn once crossed our course, bounding nimbly along from the crest of one wave to the crest of another. And close after, in full chase, a white hound with red ears. We saw also a lovely young maiden on a brown steed with a golden apple in her hand. And as she passed swiftly by, a young warrior on a white steed plunged after her, wearing, wearing a long flowing mantle of yellow silk and holding a gold-hilted sword in his hand. I knew naught of these things, and marvelling much, I asked the princess what they meant. But she answered, Heed not what you see, or he what you see here, O Sheen, for all these wonders are as nothing compared with what you shall see in Tirna Nog. At last we saw at a great distance, rising over the waves on the very verge of the sea, a palace more splendid than all the others, and as we drew near, its front glittered like the morning sun. I asked the lady what royal house was this, and who was the prince that ruled over it. This country is the land of virtues, she replied. Its king is the giant Fomor of the Blows, and its queen the daughter of the king of the land of life. Or is that the land of Liffey? As in Liffey. This, I think it's life. This Fomor brought the lady away by force from her own country and keeps her in this palace. But she has put him under Gessa that he cannot break through, never to ask her to marry him till she can find a champion to fight him in single combat. But she still remains in bondage, for no hero has yet come hither who has the courage to meet the giant. A blessing on you, golden-haired Neve, I replied. I have never heard music sweeter than your voice, and although I feel pity for this princess, yet your story, story is pleasant for me to hear. For of a certainty I will go to the palace, and try whether I can cannot kill this Fomora and free the lady. Matt Byrne is watching. A very good evening to you, Matt. So we came to land, and as we drew nigh to the palace, Squeaky Toys, uh, squ squ Squeaky... <laughs> the dog has found a Squeaky Toy. Live TV. Can't beat it. So we came to land. And as we drew nigh to the palace, the lovely young queen met us and bade us welcome. I think somebody has confiscated it. She led us in and placed us on chairs of gold, after which choice food was placed before us and drinking horns filled with mead and golden goblets of sweet wine. Sounds like a nice place, doesn't it? When we had eaten and drunk, the mild young princess told us her story while tears streamed from her soft blue eyes. And she ended by saying... I shall never return to my own country and to my father's house, so long as this great and cruel giant is alive. When I heard her sad words and saw her tears falling, I was moved with pity, and telling her to cease from her grief, I gave her my hand as a pledge that I would meet the giant and either slay him or fall myself in her defence. While we were yet speaking, we saw the giant coming towards the palace, large of body, and ugly and hateful in appearance, carrying a load of deerskins on his back and holding a great iron club in his hand. He threw down his load when he saw us, turned a surly look on the princess, and without greeting us or showing us the least mark of courtesy, he forthwith challenged me to battle in a loud, rough voice. It was not my wont to be dismayed by a call to battle or to be terrified at the sight of an enemy. 
and I went forth at once without the least fear in my heart. But though I had fought many battles in Erin against wild boars and enchanters and foreign invaders, never before did I find it so hard to preserve my life. We fought for three days and three nights, there's that magical time period again, without food or drink or sleep. For the giant did not give me a moment for rest, and neither, neither did I give him. At length, when I looked at the two princesses weeping in great fear, and when I called to mind my great father's deeds in battle, the fury of my valour arose, and with a sudden onset I felled the giant to the earth, and instantly, before he could recover himself, I cut off his head. When the maidens saw the monster lying on the ground dead, they uttered three cries of joy, and they came to me and led me into the palace. For I was indeed bruised all over and covered with gory wounds, and a sudden dizziness of brain and feebleness of body seized me. But the daughter of the king of the land of life applied precious balsam and healing herbs to my wounds and in a short time I was healed, and my cheerfulness of mind returned. Then I buried the giant in a deep and wide grave, and I raised a great cairn over him, and placed on it a stone with his name engraved in Ohm. Which, as we discussed in one of the earlier episodes, was uh, an early medieval form of writing, uh, often found on standing stones or pillar stones. We rested that night, and at the dawn of next morning, Niamh said to me that it was time for us to resume our journey to Tirnanog. So we took leave of the daughter of the King of the Land of Life, and though her heart was joyful after her release, she wept at our departure, and we were not less sorry at parting from her. When we had mounted the white steed, he galloped towards the strand, and as soon as his hoofs touched the wave, he shook himself and neighed three times. We plunged forward over the clear green sea with the speed of a march wind on a hillside, and soon we saw nothing but billows tumbling before us and billows tumbling behind us. Hello, Maria. Maria Mahan is saying, sorry, a bit late, don't worry. Better late than never, and indeed you can catch up on the video afterwards. We saw again the fawn chased by the white hound with red ears and the maiden with the golden apple passed swiftly by, followed by the young warrior in yellow stick on his white steed. And speaking of golden apples, when I'm finished reading, please remind me uh, to come back to the golden apples. And when we passed many, and again we passed many strange islands and cities and white palaces. Kirsten Salisbury is in from Canada. Very good afternoon to our friends across the Atlantic. You're very welcome, Kirsten. The sky now darkened so that the sun was hidden from our view. A storm arose and the sea was lighted up with constant flashes. But though the wind blew from every point of the heavens and the waves rose, rose up and roared around us, the white steed kept his course straight on, moving as calmly and swiftly as before through the foam and blinding spray without being delayed or disturbed in the least and without turning either to the left or to the right. And Aaron is asking a question that we haven't reached yet in the story. So I'm going to just pass over that one until we get there, Aaron. No problem. At length, the storm abated. And after a time, the sun again shone brightly. And when I looked up, I saw a country near at hand. All green, and full of flowers, with beautiful smooth plains, blue hills and bright lakes and waterfalls. Linda Nolan is saying hello from Phoenix, Arizona. Hello, Linda. Thanks, Anthony. No problem at all. You are very welcome to this uh, episode. Not far from the shore stood a palace of surpassing beauty and splendour. It was covered all over with gold and with gems of every colour, blue, green, crimson and yellow, and on each side were green awns shining with precious stones, built by artists the most skilful that could be found. I asked Neve the name of that delightful country, and she replied, This 
is my native country, Chirnanog, and there is nothing I have promised you that you will not find in it. As soon as we reached the shore, we dismounted, and now we saw advancing from the palace a troop of noble-looking warriors, all clad in bright garments, who came forward to meet and welcome us. Following these, we saw a stately, glittering host, with the king at their head wearing a robe of bright yellow satin, covered with gems and a crown that sparkled with gold and diamonds. The queen came after, attended by a hundred, hundred lovely look a hundred lovely young maidens, and as they advanced towards us, it seemed to me that this king and queen exceeded all the kings and queens of the world in beauty and gracefulness and majesty. Herbert Bennett is saying hello from New York City. Thanks so much. Well, thanks a million for joining us, Herbert, from New York. I was in uh, the Big Apple in November and had a fabulous time there. Uh, first time I'd ever been in New York. And I hope to get the opportunity to return there when everything has calmed down, which hopefully it will. And after they had kissed her, her daughter, the king took my hand and said aloud in the hearing of the host, This is Oshin, son of Finn, for whom my daughter Neave travelled over the sea to Erin. This is Oshin, who is to be the husband of Neave of the golden hair. We give you a hundred thousand welcomes, Brave Oshin, and of course in Irish that is the famous and familiar greeting, Caed Meal of a hundred thousand welcomes. You will be forever young in this land. All kinds of delights and innocent pleasures are awaiting you. And my daughter, the gentle golden hair haired Neve, shall be your wife. For I am the king of Tirnanog. I gave thanks to the king, and I bowed low to the queen after which we went into the palace where we found a banquet prepared. The feasting and rejoicing lasted for ten days, and on the last day I was wedded to the gentle Neve of the golden hair. I lived in the land of youth for more than three hundred years, but it appeared to me that only three years had passed since the day I parted from my friends. So this dilation of time that we met in the story uh, in the stories of Bruna Bonia, where Dogda sends Elkmar on an errand, uh, making it last, making a, a single day errand asked, last for nine months, is a familiar refrain, and here we see it again. At the end of that time, I began to have a longing desire to see my father Finn and all my old companions, and I asked leave of Neave and of the king to visit Erin. The king gave permission, and Neave said, I will give consent, though I feel sorrow in my heart, for I fear much you will never return to me. I replied that I would surely return, and that she need not feel any doubt or dread, for that the white steed knew the way, and would bring me back in safety. Then she addressed me in these words, which seemed very strange to me. I will not refuse this request, though your journey afflicts me with great grief and fear. Erin is not now as it was when you left it. The great King Finn and his Fina are all gone, and you will find instead of them a holy father and hosts of priests and saints. Now think well on what I say to you, and keep my words in your mind. If once you alight from the white steed, you will never come back to me. And again I warn you, if you place your feet on the green sod in Erin, you will never return to this lovely land. A third time, O Oshin, my beloved husband, a third time I say to you, if you alight from the white steed, you will never see me again. I promised that I would faithfully attend to her words, and that I would not alight from the white steed. Then, as I looked into her gentle face and marked her grief, my heart was weighed down with sadness, and my tears flowed plentifully, but even so, my mind was bent on coming back to Erin. When I had mounted the white steed, he galloped straight towards the shore. We moved as swiftly as before over the clear sea. The wind overtook the waves, and we overtook the wind, so that we straightway left the land of youth behind, 
and we passed by many islands and cities till at length we landed on the green shores of Erin. As I travelled on through the country, I looked closely around me, but I scarcely knew the old places, for everything seemed strangely altered. I saw no sign of Finn and his host, and I began to dread that Neave's saying was coming true. At length, I espied at a distance a company of little men and women. So the note here says the gigantic race of the Fina had all passed away and Erin was now inhabited by people who looked very small in O'Sheen's eyes. All mounted on horses and as small as themselves and when I came near they greeted me kindly and courteously. They looked at me with wonder and curiosity and they marvelled much at my great size and at the beauty and majesty of my person. I asked them about Finn and the Fina whether they were still living or if any sudden disaster had swept them away. And one replied, We have heard of the hero Finn, who ruled the Fina of Erin in times of old, and who never had an equal for bravery and wisdom. The poets of the Gaels have written many books concerning his deeds and the deeds of the Fina, which we cannot now relate. But they are all gone long since, for they lived many ages ago. We have heard also, and we have seen it written in very old books, that Finn had a son named Oshin. Now this Oshin went with a young fairy maiden to Tirnanog, and his father and his friends sorrowed greatly after him, and sought him long, but he was never seen again. When I heard all this, I was filled with amazement, and my heart grew heavy with great sorrow. I silently turned my steed away from the wandering people, and set forward straight away for Alan in the, of the Mighty Deeds on the broad green plains of Leinster. It was a miserable journey to me, and though my mind, being full of sadness at all I saw and heard, forecasted further sorrows, I was grieved more than ever when I reached Allen. For there, and that's the hill of Allen in County Modern Day County Kildare, for there indeed I found the hill deserted and lonely, and my father's palace all in ruins and overgrown with grass and weeds. I turned slowly away, and afterwards fared through the land in every direction in search of my friends. But I met only crowds of little people, all strangers, who gazed on me with wonder, and none knew me. I visited every place throughout the country where I knew the Fianna had lived. But I found their houses all like Allen, solitary and in ruins. At length I came to Glenis Mole, and that's a fine valley about seven miles south of Dublin through which the river Dodder flows, where many a time I had hunted in days of old with the Fina, and there I saw a crowd of people in the glen. As soon as they saw me, one of them came forward and said, Come to us, thou mighty hero, and help us out in, of our strait, for you are a man of vast strength. I went to them and found a number of men trying in vain to raise a large flat stone. It was half lifted from the ground, but those who were under it were not strong enough either to raise it further or to free themselves from its weight, and they were in great distress and on the point of being crushed to death. I thought it a shameful thing that so many men should be unable to lift this stone which Oscar, if he were alive, would take in his right hand and fling over the heads of the feeble crowd. And that's interesting because Oscar, of course, would have been Oshin's grandfather, the father of Fionn. And um, it's interesting, too, how many stories in Ireland relate to standing stones that were thrown by Fionn. Uh, and maybe there are examples of Oscar uh, and maybe even Oshin doing the same thing, but many of them relate to Fionn or Finn. After I had looked a little while, I stooped forward and seized the flag with one hand, and putting forth my strength, I flung its seven perches from its place and relieved the little men. But with the great strain, the golden saddle girth broke, and, bounding forward to keep myself from falling, I suddenly came to the ground on my two feet. The moment the white steed felt himself free, he shook himself and neighed. Then, starting off with the speed of a cloud shadow on a March day, he left me standing helpless and sorrowful. Instantly, a woeful change came over me. 
the sight of my eyes began to fade. The ruddy beauty of my face fled. I lost all my strength, and I fell to the earth, a poor, withered old man, blind and wrinkled and feeble. The white steed was never seen again. I never recovered my sight, my youth or my strength. And I have lived in this manner, sorrowing without ceasing for my gentle, golden-haired wife, Neave, and thinking ever of my father, Finn, and of the lost companions of my youth. And thus ends the story of Oshin in Chirnanog. I think you will agree. Uh, a very sad tale in the end, in the telling. One has to be very careful in these matters, uh, not to upset people too deeply. Uh, uh, and to perhaps examine some of the themes in it and the everlasting Irish mythical theme of the other world which is sometimes in the sky sometimes beneath the earth sometimes out especially in the western ocean not so much in the Irish Sea in the eastern ocean um, and I suppose the hope that we all hold on to uh, that when we pass on from this life uh, that we go somewhere else a, a, such a land uh, where you know there are uh, white palaces and everything's bedecked in jewels and there are great feasts and, and banquets and everybody's happy and nobody suffers and nobody uh, is ill or anything like that uh, and it is our hope while we are alive in this world that indeed our loved ones who have gone before us are in such a wonderful magical land and that's something that we I think many of us uh, some people today are totally atheistic and uh, totally against such beliefs but uh, I believe it's a lovely a uh, thing that we should hold on to and a lovely romantic belief. The other thing too is, in a way, these characters of myth, they live on for us. They are very vibrantly alive. I mean, the stories of Fionn and Oshin and Oscar were still being told in Ireland, passed on from mouth to ear, from generation to generation, right up until the, into the 20th century. Um, uh, and there is something of a magical past alive in those tales. And we should never forget that. And... The one thing that we should earnestly hope is that from our present age that we might leave something of ourselves worthy of remembrance other than the things that we build with our hands. You know, the great edifices and the buildings and structures that we make. Something of our story, something of a myth, something worth remembering, something honourable, something heroic, you know, something romantic. What's wrong with a bit of romance? There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. These are the things that get us through life. Joseph Campbell said that the principal function of mythology was to help us bear this, bur the burden of this corporeal life. The one that we know will come an end to an end for us and the one that we, we see coming to an end for others. And so we should bear that in mind that these tales are just a way for us to help to do that. In relation to the golden apples, uh... I think that um, I'm just uh, just uh, pardon me while I just look up a, a web page here and while I catch up. Uh, uh, um, the golden apples uh, are very interesting. Uh, Yeats used them in a poem. Um, and I'm going to recite that poem for you by heart, which is absolutely what I'm going to do. Um, but uh, I just speculated in trying to dissect this poem, which is called The Song of Wandering Angus and which would have been very apt. Uh, for our story of uh, Ashlinga Angus, or the dream vision of Angus. Um, the symbolism of apples is both cosmic, relating to ages of time, and non-temporal. They might pluck and indeed eat apples, but the imagery here is of the passing of ages. The silver apple, and this is from Yeats' poem, which I'm going to read, of the full moon appears to have... Sorry, I'm not going to read, I'm going to recite by heart. The silver apple of the moon full moon appears to have bits taken out of it as it wanes towards invisibility but then is replenished again the sun although modern scientists know has a finite lifetime is considered in mythology as an eternal thing one of the beautiful heavenly other worlds of irish myth is known as awan aulach the region of apples and of course we dealt with that yesterday in relation to mananon maclear the t two of the danans sea god who, who lived there and that's episode 10 which you can catch up on in the link that i shared earlier on it is an island full of trees bearing the most beautiful apples lula father one of the chief two of the danan deities was said to have been raised there awan aulach has been compared with the avalon of arthurian myth in another story, Conla, son of the High King, Con of the Hundred Battles, is offered an apple by a fairy woman from the land of promise, Tyr Thorngra. 
He is sated for a month by the apple, requiring no other food or drink. When the fairy woman returned at the end of the month, Conla sailed away with, with to be with her forever. Isn't that lovely? Isn't that just beautiful? That's exactly what we need right now, isn't it? We just need... I, I mean, what's wrong with being romantic? What's wrong with this... You know, getting lost in these stories. What's wrong with it? It's a lovely distraction, you know. And that's where we find Yeats as, as Angus, entranced by his beautiful psychopomp, who he follows off into eternal realms, away from the telluric realities of corporeal life and all of its dreariness and sorrows. What more could I say right now that's apt for the current situation? The fire in his head is satisfied the, by the imagery of the soul guide, with the lovely apple blossom in her hair, taking him to elevated places of the soul, beyond the earthly concerns of billowing fires and cooking food. So right now, I'm going to recite to you the poem, which is called The Song of Wandering Angus. And I, do, I won't do it justice, I know I won't. But if you want a really, really, really beautiful version, then please go onto YouTube and search for Michael Gambon recir- reciting the same poem. And the imagery and the music and the way he does it is absolutely superb. I promise you it will melt your heart. Uh, How does it start? (laughs) I got so carried away there I've forgotten how it starts. So here we go. The Song of Wandering Angus. I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing, and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream, and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor, I went to blow the fire aflame. But something rustled on the floor, and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded through the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hands and walk among long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. And that is the beautiful poem, uh, The Song of Wandering Angus from WB Yeats. And as I said, if you think it's lovely and you think I've even made a half effort at it, go and have a look at Michael Gambon reading the same thing or reciting, should I say. He's not reading, reciting. Um, a, a, f- a fabulous, fabulous effort. Now, um just before I go, or just before I take questions, because undoubtedly some of you uh, will have questions. If you go to the schools collection, which I was telling you about a couple of episodes again, you know that the folklore was collected by the Folklore Commission in the 1930s. Uh, the the lore of Oshin and the Fina <coughs> and Finn and the Fina and the land of youth and Neve of the Golden Hair was very, very vibrantly alive in so many communities in Ireland in the first certainly in the first part of the uh the uh twentieth uh, century. So just for instance here we'll just uh we'll just uh we'll just go in and read just one example. Oshin and Fionn were hunting deer in O. Henry, wherever that is. They saw a rider coming towards them. Fionn asked her what was her name and what did she want and where she was from. The lady sh- said she was from Tirnanog and th- that her name was Neve, the daughter of the king. She also said she wanted Oshin as her husband. Fionn said he would let his son Oshin go with her. But he asked Oshin to come back and see all the Fina and himself. Oshin promised he would. He mounted the white steed with the lady. He then bade goodbye to the Fina. Off galloped the white steed westward. When he came to the ocean, when his gold shoes touched the water, he could go on it. After a long time on the ocean, they reached Tirnanog. Of course, this is a compressed version and the folk version of the tale we heard, we just uh, were reading. The first thing Oshin noticed was a gigantic castle. He asked Neve what was that castle used for. She told them that was the castle of the giant. He was a very bad giant and he used to kill people. Oshin said he would either kill the giant or be killed himself. 
As soon as Oshin had these words said, the giant came over the hill. Oshin rushed at him and killed him. Neve was delighted, so they had feasting for ten days, and then they were married. Oshin, <laughs> the dog's getting excited. Oshin had a great time in Chernanog, and he never got old. After some time, Oshin wanted to see Era. He asked Neve to give him the white steed. She she gave the steed to him, and she told him not to leave his feet on Irish soil. Oshin came back to Ireland. He met some men and asked them where was Fionn and the Fianna. They said they had read of Fionn and of Oshin. So he went to Tara and then he went to County Wicklow and there he saw some men trying to lift a stone. Oshin went to them and they asked him to lift the flag. Oshin stooped to lift the flag. The saddle broke and Oshin fell to the ground and he became a human being again. He became a wrinkled old man. The white steed galloped off and was never seen again. And that was oh i can't actually read the name which is a pity uh the collector there was joseph egan and you see how even in the early 20th century that people were able to recount all of the details of the story in a in a in a compressed or uh, um in, in a shortened form but that was recited by heart uh by a lady or a gentleman to this uh collector uh and you know, if you just go into the collection there, uh, I'll paste that as a link again uh, or, or into the comments so that you can follow it yourself. Ducas.ie, that's D-U-C-H-A-S dot I-E, which is uh, the manuscript collection of the Folklore Commission and the Schools Collection. Uh, of course, uh, part of the reason that Oshin is able to recall all this is because uh, there was a, a, a an apparently a dialogue that took place between Oshin and St. Patrick. Uh, where uh, Oshin recounts all of the tales. And so, for instance, there's a version there. Um, uh, I think this is from, isn't it, Akalama Shanorak, the colloquy uh, of the old men. The housekeeper complained com complained Oshin to St. Patrick, and the saint remonstrated with him, but Oshin maintained that he had told nothing but the truth and offered to prove it, provided he were given time. Now the monks had a female hound and at this time she had a litter of pups only a week or two old. Oshin asked the boy who used lead him round to bring him out to the yard and to put the pups one by one into his hand. He then threw them towards the wall and asked the boy to tell him what happened. The boy said they all fell down except one and that he was making great efforts to stick on the wall. Oshin said to keep that pup and rear it for himself for a day and a year and to take the others and drowned them oh my god how horrible at the end of a year and a day Oshin got the boy to out the hound on a leash and then they set off to prove the truth of what he had told the housekeeper they travelled for miles and miles till at last they came to an old burying ground there were a lot of old huge tombs there and Oshin asked the boy was there anything growing around some of the tombs and the boy said there were ivy leaves there bigger than any ca cabbage Oshin ordered him to pick a few leaves of it and put them in a sack to bring them home to the old housekeeper after that, Oshin described a certain tomb to the lad and asked him to lead him to it. The boy did so, and then Oshin asked him, would he be able to remove the stone from outside the entrance of the tomb? Interesting. The boy <coughs> the boy said he could not. Then Oshin told him to guide himself so that he could push it with his shoulder. The boy did that all right, and with one push, Oshin sent the stone halfway across the churchyard. After that, he told the boy to go into the tomb and bring out a whistle he would find in it. The boy was rather nervous, but he agreed to go in if Oshin held his hand. Oshin did, and in a few minutes they got the whistle. After that, they set out on their travels again, and they journeyed on till they came to a certain hill. Then Oshin sat down and he began to blow the whistle. After a while, he asked the boy, did he see anything coming? The boy said he saw hundreds and hundreds of birds coming from all directions. Oshin asked, was there a very big one amongst them? And the boy said, no. Oshin then blew the whistle again and soon the boy called out, I see a huge black bird fly flying towards us. She is as big as all the rest of the birds put together and she would kill them if all if she does not kill us. Watch her, said Oshin, and when she's on the point of alighting, take the dog off the leash and set, set him at her. The boy did as he was told. And then, followed a f there, and then followed a fearful fight between the hound and the bird. It lasted for hours, but at last the hound won and the bird was killed. Oshin then ordered the boy to cut a quarter or, or, or thigh off the bird. The boy managed that much with a little help from Oshin. After that, he told him to carry the quarter home, but the boy could not even move it. Then Oshin said, put the claw into my hand. 
and when he got hold of the claw, he hoisted the quarter onto his shoulder, and then he set off in triumph for the monastery with the whistle, the ivy leaves bigger than any cabbage the old housekeeper had ever cooked, and her quarter of a black bird bigger than any joint she ever cooked. Well, uh, that's uh, the conclusion of one of just many, many stories. So as you can see, if you search uh, Ducas, you'll see uh, there are lots and lots and lots and lots. Some of those are in Irish. So uh, you, uh, some of you, and including me, won't be able to understand well, at least some of the words. Um, but uh, what's interesting is that Joseph Campbell pointed out that some of the stories of the Fianna, uh, which had survived in manuscript form from the Middle Ages, were compared with the folk versions still being recounted in the 20th century, and that they were equal uh, and identical in their details. So a fabulous indication of just how long stories can survive in oral form without necessarily being written down. So just scrolling back to make sure I haven't missed anything. Uh, Federica says, I love Yeats's poetry. What's not to love is the gorgeous. Fiona Nagiola Chiara is in... Good day from Western Australia. Very nice of you to join us, Fiona. Very happy to have you along. Freya, as in old times, stories are still a delight for and food for thought. And yeah, I thought that maybe one thing that was kind of useful uh, about doing this is that there is that just sort of little bit of romance and maybe escapism about it and distraction from the current situation uh, and there's something lovely about retelling a story that you kind of get a feeling in your bones for has been told not just for several generations but in fact for several centuries i mean it is quite probable that many of these stories go back to the earliest uh, times uh, ad and in fact, there's a good possibility, as I've kind of often suggested in my work, that there are stories that go back all the way into prehistory and some of them as far back as the Neolithic. I'm convinced of that. Barb Jordan said that was lovely. Hearts, hearts. Lovely, Barb. And I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. Lee Trabal said, awesome. Jules Cousin said, can you link the YouTube? And you read it so beautifully. So again, if you just go into the blog on the Mythical Ireland page, uh, all the YouTube videos are embedded there. But if you just want to go direct to the YouTube channel and you want to skip all that, well, to be honest, the handiest way is to go to the blog. Uh, the YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash mythical Ireland or youtube.com forward slash user forward slash mythical Ireland. But I'll just post that in uh, just underneath there, Jules, as a direct link. Margaret Ring says, Anthony, take a bow. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed it, Margaret. Uh, Herbert Bennett says beautiful. Catherine Wall McManus says beautiful. Maeve Fianna Callahan says hello from Portland. Just carrying the very e catching the very end of this live. I'm excited to listen from the beginning. And as I said, yeah, it'll be shortly available as a video on the Facebook page, and then I'll upload it to YouTube later. Mariana Dunn says greetings from Alexandria, Virginia. I love what you share regularly. Well, I'm enjoying it, Mariana. And as I say, it's very nice to be able to retell all these old stories. Federica says, so true. I agree with you that these stories are so ancient. Yeah. And who knows how far back they really go, you know. So at some point, I will probably, uh, because, you know, let's be honest, uh, uh, there's tons of material. Uh, at some point, I will read from, there's the Irish version, Agalo Mashinorach, which is entirely uh, printed in Irish. Uh, and its English translation, uh, uh, which is Tales of the Elders of Ireland, a new translation of Akaloma Senorak, a Shenorak by Anne Dooley and Harry Rowe. Uh, now, I won't be able to read much uh, from that because, again, as I said, I'm always conscious of not uh, breaching copyright and I want to be fair to everybody. But what I will do is I will plug uh, absolutely uh, all the books that I read from and, and encourage you to buy them. Uh, but it's interesting because it's a crossover. It's basically, uh, I, I guess, that the monks had come across all these stories and wanted to reconcile them with their own faith. And suppose, uh, I suppose, give people a reason for understanding their reasons for writing it down, because it might have been an unpopular thing at the time to be preserving what was obviously pre-Christian pagan mythology. And so the, the aspect where... St. Patrick is not just talking to some of the old heroes, but in fact, the aspect where he 
baptizes them to the new faith um i suppose in a way makes the whole thing acceptable you know so we don't know what changes were wrought by the christian monks on some of the stories you know um and uh, Wendy Holmes says, I love these. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome, Wendy. Margaret is saying, just a suggestion. Maybe you could read John O'Donoghue some evening, a modern bard and describes beautifully the heart of Ireland. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure about copyright issues there, Margaret, but uh, if I can, I will. Absolutely. Uh, I'll ask for permission. That's what I'll do. Um, I'll ask for permission. But John O'Donoghue is such a fabulous scholar uh, and uh, a human being so full of love and compassion. Lee Trabal, thank you so much, Anthony. I appreciate you. Well, I appreciate the sentiments and I'm glad to do it. I really am. I'm glad to do it. So as usual, uh, I'll hang around for a few minutes for questions or comments and suggestions for further episodes. So among other suggestions we have had are Bowen, which I'm coming to hopefully in the coming days. I'm waiting for uh, the Dinchenicus to arrive in hard copy. Um, I got one volume of it in the post the other day. It's quite a brittle copy of uh, part four, but I need part three. Queen Maeve, which I'm getting round to. Finn, well, absolutely, we need to include Finn uh, and maybe the Battle of Ventry. Skota uh, was suggested by Maureen O'Leary. I'm going to try and do an episode on that. I just fear that there may not be enough uh, to make a, a an hour long. But 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 I'll see and I'll, try, I'll do my best. Morigu or Morrigan. Uh, more Reagan is coming in the next couple of days hopefully Bridget the Kolyuk we dealt with the Kolyuk of Lock Crew we could possibly expand that out into a wider uh, theme the Children of Lear absolutely but I, I was looking at that and again I could I could read Joyce's version that would take two episodes to read the whole story but yes the Children of Lear uh, Jacqueline Kennedy suggested that one Deirdre and the Sons of Ishnak we will be doing oh Jacqueline Kennedy is suggesting Brian Baru I hadn't even thought of Brian of course Brian Baru and the Vikings you know um yeah that could that could make an interesting uh, uh or it absolutely will make an interesting uh, episode uh brian baru uh others oh, macha and horses in celtic myth which i thought was a brilliant suggestion anya the fairy queen of munster margaret ring uh, uh suggested that one uh, the role of the harp in irish myth was suggested by caitlin moon and the high man, Maria Mahan wanted to hear more about the high man, which we will deal with. Absolutely would be my great pleasure to talk about the high man. Rachel Connolly is saying the two had a Danon. Well, yes. Now, we did deal with the two had a Danon in the first couple of episodes, Rachel. But, for instance, the episode about Dogda, he's two had a Danon. Angus Og is two had a Danon. Mananon is two had a Danon. The two had a Danon will inevitably feature in lots of episodes. So there'll be no shortage of two had a Danon. Maeve, Fina... Sorry, they're going too fast now. <laughs> Maeve Fina Callahan is suggesting uh, uh, Queen Maeve. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, and um, we will, we will. That's on the list, of course. Jules, where did that hour go? Another time, another place. Thank you for taking us on another journey. Whoa, so much to come. I hope so, Jules. Uh, I hope so. And I hope this is just the beginning of a great adventure. Herbert says, thank you so much, Anthony. And Jules' cousin says, and the Morrigan. Yes, absolutely. That is duly noted. Just to mention, as I always do before I go, that uh, all of the things that I do for Mythical Ireland, I do out of passion and love for the subject I've been studying and joyfully reading and visiting landscapes and photographing and making films and podcasts and giving talks and doing tours for years and years and years, 21 years, in fact, this year. Uh, I've just pasted in a link to my patron pat Patreon page, no, that's actually the donations page on the Mythical Ireland website. <laughs> Sorry, if you wanted to make a one-off donation uh, to uh, to help Mythical Ireland. Otherwise, if you want to become a patron and support with a regular monthly amount, uh, I'd be very glad to uh, have you along. And if you become a patron of Mythical Ireland, you get rewarded for your patronage. You get exclusive access to pictures and podcasts and videos and uh, uh, uh uh, blog posts uh, and you get a uh, first uh, uh, look at everything and you get a load of stuff that other people don't get so have a look at the patreon link that i've just pasted in and uh, and see if there's something there uh, that you may be able to do 
Aaron Durrett says, so if the Tuha de Danon can manipulate time, so Cormac can come back unharmed and back into his own time, how come sometimes Earth time and Chernanog time are sometimes 300 years apart and can't be changed? It's a very interesting question, Aaron. And I suppose it's probably got more to do with the fundamental different nature of uh, the earthly carnal world and the spirit world, I suppose. And it's entirely possible, well, I think anyway, it's entirely possible that the, the druids or the shamans or chief priests or whatever they might have been called of prehistory, that they may have sort of gone on other world journeys, whether or not aided by the use of uh, substances such as psilocybin from mushrooms or whatever or whether they just did so by naturally fasting and ed entering a deep meditative state in the chambers of the great monuments it is possible that they you know may have felt that they had visited ancestral or otherworldly realms and brought back the stories uh, and seen people uh, beyond in the beyond there i mean that's something that's recounted quite often in stories and a chapter that I, I wrote in my book about Newgrange, uh, Monument, Newgrange Monument to Immortality that dealt with the similarities between the design of Newgrange and aspects of the near-death experience, which is very interesting. Samantha Healy, another great hour flown by. Well, there you go. There's Tiernan Og for you. Or the dilation of time, which seems to be a, a topic in many of the... Uh, in many of the stories. Uh, Freya says, thank you for the excellent storytelling, Anthony. Stay safe all. Thank you. Oh, and Jacqueline says, and bloopers. Awesome for that. Just in case you haven't seen it, um, uh, I'm having a laugh at my own expense here. Um, a while back, I made a film for patrons, which was eventually released to the public. And uh, this is a video on YouTube containing the blooper reel, uh, all the little mistakes that were made during the filming. And uh, I I'm looking back at it and getting a good laugh at myself and hopefully you'll get a laugh yourselves. Aaron Durrett says, hi, man. Yes. So I'm I'm figuring that's something we should do sooner rather than later. So let me get my thinking cap on in relation. That's a very exciting one. And that has the prospect to go on for longer than an hour. That has the prospect actually to go on for two episodes or either that or one very long one. So yes, Samantha Healy says definitely to the Morrigan. Yes, Margaret Ring says thank you. Another hour of magic. Thanks for coming along, Margaret. Uh, Fiona Nagyola Chiara says I'm a patron and more than encourage others to join well Fiona thank you very much for that and I'm very very glad to have you as a patron and I really truly appreciate your support thank you uh, uh, a million times Jacqueline Kennedy says they astral projected well maybe they did and maybe that's something also for discussion when we're able to collate enough uh, 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 sources is to discuss how the myths might indicate how they might have traveled into other realms you know Aaron Durrett thank you so much this is really helping keep my spirits up well good stuff and the wonderful thing is look feel free to uh, promote uh, the the links to the Facebook page on the YouTube channel and the blog to your friends and bring them along uh, and the great thing is the newcomers to this tomorrow for instance if somebody comes along to watch episode 12 and they enjoy it and they go oh brilliant Irish stories that's great they have a whole 11 episodes that they can catch up on it's a bit like Netflix you know you can catch up and uh, 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 binge watch or binge listen to uh, on the podcasts so I have a Mixcloud page which I upload the podcasts to I have just today established a Podbean uh, account now it would only allow me to upload three episodes per day so the first three episodes are on Podbean actually probably should uh, I, sh I should probably uh, um post the link into you for that again you're, you're just looking for mythical ireland so if you go on to podbean.com i think forward slash mythical ireland should do it for you actually i'm just going to view the site and just give you the, yeah it's mythical ireland dot podbean dot com so when i can post another three tomorrow so that'll be episode six another three the following day up to episode nine and hopefully i'll have caught up by the time we do uh, oh no i won't yeah i'll have because 12 is tomorrow. Anyway, we'll do our best to populate it with uh, podcasts so that you can share those as podcasts. Anyway, I better shut up now and stop talking. But um, it's been it's been a lovely episode. And I really enjoyed that. And it was great to have you all along. And come here in the meantime. Look, 
we were in a time of unprecedented uncertainty and anxiety. Uh, but we're also in a, a, a place where we've been challenged and where the challenge is being risen to on many fronts and where we have to hope that our uh, our our political and uh, medicinal chiefs uh, rise to this challenge in a mythical way and that their heroic efforts will be remembered for a long time into the future. And let's hope, look, let's hope and pray and hope and pray for effective treatments to come soon and let's all hope for this vain hope that perhaps the summer weather in the northern hemisphere uh, the warmer weather will help to improve it and help and hope that it will die out i mean i know it's all, it, perhaps some of you don't think that's realistic but hope if you haven't got hope you haven't got much hope is a light in the darkness jewel says it's been just grand thank you a grand which is a great way irish way of saying look i'm grand you know call it mythflix margaret says i like that mythflix yeah so don't catch up on Netflix, catch up on Mythflix. Anyway, look, I'll leave it at that and say very good evening to you. That is a topic we may come back to anyway, and we're certainly going to come back to Finn and the Fianna. Uh, and of course, we'll have to cover the story of Finn and the Salmon of Knowledge at some point too. But in the meantime, have a very good sa safe night or a safe afternoon or a safe morning, depending on where you are. Uh, Fiona and I'm not sure if there's someone else in there from Australia. Uh, you're in the 23rd of march you're into monday already may you have a very a safe and blessed day and uh, slán agus uh, to every one of you and hopefully uh, tomorrow uh, i'll give i'll announce the time as usual sometime around the middle of the day i announce the time of the uh, live webcast it depends on work which thankfully i'm still uh, doing and also uh, the forbearance of my family and that I, I can add this into the schedule at a time that suits them as well. So good night and uh, a safe night. And remember, uh, obey the curfews, uh, obey the physical distancing that we're calling it now because social distancing sounds wrong because it sounds like they're, we're at a physical distance from each other. But we shouldn't be at a social distance from each other. We should certainly be still maintaining contact. And in that regard, aren't we blessed that we have the technology that we have that wasn't around a generation ago that we can stay in touch that we can send each other messages that we can video uh, call each other on various apps and by various means and see each other's faces and hear each other's voices we're very lucky in that regard that we're not in a complete lockdown as it were and and uh, uh, totally alone and remember too something that i should always uh, try to encourage is that at times like this this is the time when it's lovely to have a library of books to get lost in uh, and so remember to take your books out and even if it's fiction and it's novels don't worry about it uh, you take a book out and get lost in the story and enjoy it safe night to all of you uh, and uh, until tomorrow this is anthony murphy for live irish myths with mythical ireland good night everybody <laughs>